mean you've missed all that and you want me to start again? Um, so, um, people do occasionally appeal to God, but if they do, that's because they believe they've got an argument for the existence of God, and, and you will hear philosophers doing that. But most philosophers, or all philosophers, will try their best to explain things without appeal to God before they appeal to God, if in the end they do appeal to God. So, we're searching for natural explanations. Um, and the subject matter of philosophy, and this is one of the things that's so wonderful about philosophy, is everything. I mean, as a philosopher, you, you're not constrained to um, looking at one part of the world. There's a philosophy of physics, there's a philosophy of psychology, there's a philosophy of religion, there's a philosophy of mathematics, there's a philosophy of absolutely everything. And that's because um, absolutely every subject is a subject that requires um, concepts that must be applied in that subject. So, for example, if you're a scientist, um, then you'll look for causes. Um, so the causal relation is extremely important to you. Um, but a scientist doesn't stop and say, well, what is causation? That's the job of a philosopher. So a philosopher says, well, OK, what are these causes you're appealing to? Can causation run backwards? Um, you, you think that a cause comes before its effects, but is that necessary? I mean, are there worlds in which causes come after their effects? Is there backwards causation? Um, and what is causation? We, we know that the evidence for causation is a correlation, but we also know that there are correlations without causation. Um, so um, there's a correlation, for example, between the time at which the MMR jab is given and the development of autistic spectrum disorders. Um, now, there's a correlation there um, because the time at which the MMR jab is given also happens to be just before the time at which autism tends to develop. Um, but there's a correlation. Is there a causal, causal relation? Maybe some people think there is, but, but most people these days don't think there is, that this is a coincidence. It just happens that the MMR jab is given at that time. Um, so, so what philosophers do is, whereas a zoologist, for example, um, creates a picture of the world, the zoological world, the philosopher cre creates a picture of the zoologist's picture of the world, so stands back one. Um, if you like, and thinks about the concepts that are applied in that discipline. So here are a few um, philosophy ofs. Um, so philosophy of mind, for example. Um, what's the relation between the mind and the brain? Um, I was listening to, to something on the television the other day, and every time the person meant, I think, meant mind, she used the word brain. And this is a very common assumption these days. What we assume is that the mind and the brain are the same thing. Um, but actually, the question of whether they are indeed the same thing is a very important philosophical question, to which the answer is almost certainly no. Um, because if the mind is the same thing, if you think of a neural state, um, that's um, a bit of electrical activity in the brain, a neural event, and a mental event. Well, the thing about a mental event is it's, uh, let's take a belief. A essential condition for a belief is that it's got to have a content. Okay, all beliefs are about something, aren't they? You don't have a belief that isn't about something. Well, this property of aboutness is, is a very important property. A new brain state could have a property of being about anything. So, for example, what's your name? Michelle. Michelle. I'm entertaining a thought about Michelle right now. Okay, and you are uh, too, because you're thinking it's the lady sitting at the front, etc. Um, now, do you think that I could have that very thought if Michelle didn't exist? Could, could I have that, the thought that I'm having, if Michelle didn't exist? No. Okay, you, anyone think yes? You don't admit to it now, do you? <laughs> so many people have said no. Um, some people say, I mean, it's certainly true that I could have a thought very like the thought I'm having. I could have a thought that um, it's as if with me there is somebody sitting there with blonde hair and a, an orange striped top 
and things like that. I could think that, couldn't I? But could I have a thought about Michelle if Michelle didn't exist? Answer, no. But I, my brain is the way it is whether Michelle exists or not, isn't it? Um, so, so the mind has properties that the brain doesn't seem to have. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the mind isn't the brain. Um, I mean, there, there are things that you look at from different perspectives and they seem to have different properties. Um, but it's one of the reasons that you might want to stop and think about just assuming that the mind is the brain, because that, that's a big assumption. It's an assumption too far, most philosophers would say these days. Uh, in fact, dualism, um, which you'll probably have heard of, Cartesian dualism, Descartes was the first person to think that the mind isn't the brain, that these are two quite separate things, um, although he put it, the mind isn't the body. Um, and he had a sort of substance dualism. He thought the mind was a completely different stuff. Um, well, the, the modern day dualist probably doesn't think that. Um, so they would say that the mind is realized by the brain, but it's not identical to the brain. Um, so the question of what the relationship is between the mind and the brain is, is a huge one. And other people think, well, do mental states exist? Well, you must think, well, of course they exist. I'm <laughs> entertaining one right now. I can introspect. <laughs> and, and, um, but actually, there are people called the eliminativists um, who argue that we can eliminate mental states from our ontology. Now, our ontology is our list of what exists. So um, some of you have ghosts on that list, um, and some of you don't, and some of you have God on that list, and some of you don't, and, and so on. Um, but most of us have mental states on that list. We really think that there are such things as beliefs and desires and intentions and experiences of red-striped tops and so on. Um, but the epiphenom uh, the sorry, the eliminativists think that mental states are something that we postulate in explanation of behavior. And if we can explain that behavior without appeal to mental states, we can eliminate mental states because we have no more reason to think they exist. A bit fishy, you might think, but, but think about a woodlouse. <laughs> Um, a woodlouse, you might think, likes it under rocks. Okay, it, believe, uh, it likes the damp and it believes it's damp under rocks and that's why it intends to go for a rock. Um, every time you pick up a rock you find woodlice, or I do in my garden. Um, and what's happening, if I say to you, well okay, you can postulate beliefs, woodlice beliefs, it's damp under rocks, you can postulate woodlouse desires, I like it under rocks and things like that, in explanation of woodlouse behavior. But actually, if I tell you that woodlice embody a mechanism, um, which is such that if it's damp, if the air around the woodlouse is damp, the woodlouse will move. And it'll move at a speed that's determined by how damp the air is. Um, so if it's very damp, it'll go fast. And if it's not very damp, it'll go slow until it gets damp enough that the woodlouse stops. And the woodlouse moves in the direction that it's pointing. <laughs> it, it doesn't make for that rock. It, if it happens to be pointing towards that rock, that's where it'll go when the air around it is damp enough. And this is a behavioral mechanism called a taxis. Or is it kinesis? I can't remember, but it really doesn't matter. It, it's a behavioral mechanism that we share too. And moths, they fly into the light. They have a, a phototaxis, positive phototaxis. They fly towards the light. Um, and actually, once you know that that's why a woodlouse does what it does, we don't have to attribute beliefs and desires to the woodlouse, do we? In fact, it becomes pointless. We, we eliminate the idea of woodlouse beliefs and desires. There's no such thing as the woodlouse's mind. The woodlouse doesn't have a mind. We don't need to postulate a mind. We can explain all its behavior without appealing to a mind. And the eliminativists think we can explain all your behavior without appeal to a mind as well. Um, so isn't it odd though? I mean, can we have reason to believe that we don't have beliefs? Actually, we can. 
and the eliminative argument is a very, very good one. And you can't just reject it by saying it defeats itself because we, we have to believe that eliminativism is true. We have to have reasons for believing it's true. Um, if they're right that we can explain all human behavior, and of course what we explain human behavior in terms of is brain states. So the eliminativists will agree that brain states are not mental states, that they agree that there is no identity, but they think, as it's um, brain states that explain our behavior, we can just reject mental states, we don't need them at all. So um, counterintuitively, you don't have beliefs or desires or intentions, and you're not rational. Sorry to bring that news to you. Um, so these, these, I'm just going through a couple of questions here. That's philosophy of mind, that's the sort of thing. Are animals rational? Um, are, are pianos rational? I mean, maybe this piano thinks that it's at the center of the universe and it likes being there, so it's not going to move for anyone. Um, that's why it's staying still in this awkward position. Okay, that, that's philosophy of mind. Let's have a quick look at philosophy of language. Okay, what is meaning? I mean, isn't it interesting that all I'm doing is making noises? And if I had a flip chart, I could make squiggles on a board. And you would look at them, and you're listening to me, and you're understanding what I'm saying. You're grasping it. You're somehow grasping the content of what I'm saying. Isn't that pretty magical? I mean, it is extraordinary, isn't it? How, what is meaning? Why do my words have meaning? And we could say that it's something like, um, I mean, there's such a thing as natural meaning. So smoke means fire. Um, so you see smoke, and smoke is causally related to fire. And you think, OK, there's smoke. There'll be a fire somewhere because they're causally related. Um, but meaning isn't like that. Um, so I could say, um, if what's your name, sir? Z. 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 So Z asks me, um, is so-and-so a good philosopher? And I say, um, his handwriting is excellent. <laughs> now, though the words I've just uttered have not, in your mind before, I don't think, unless you've listened to me before, been correlated with the meaning that they have in that context. But you all know what I've said, don't you? You can all work out that, that meaning immediately. Um, and you don't work that out from the strict and literal meaning of the words that I used, um, because the words that I used don't have the strict and literal meaning that I used them um, to, to convey. Got tied up in my own syntax there. But, um, so so what, is, what is meaning? And how do words get meaning? And some people think that uh, meaning comes from use. So we, we point to something, we point to um, blue, okay, so we ostensibly define something by saying that's blue. Well, when I point like that, what am I pointing to? I could be pointing to curtains, I could be pointing to folds of fabric, I could be pointing to fabric, I could be pointing to the colour. Um, how, how do we manage to pick up from the information that we have as children when we're taught? What, what exactly words mean um, when they're pointed out to us. So that's the sort of thing you look at in, in philosophy of language. And another one is um, reference. Um, so Z refers to him. Well, how does it do that? And how does a name latch on to a person? How, how does reference I and mean, just in the same way as how meaning comes about, how does reference come about? This is the sort of thing that philosophers of language uh, think about. Um, philosophy of science, um, I've talked about already um, causation, which is a key topic in the uh, philosophy of science. But also such things as um, observation being theory laden. Okay, what, what do I mean by that? Well, you may think that what a scientist does is they observe the world, okay, so, so uh, either by observation or perhaps by experiment, and then they um, take down what they see, and then they use logic to build a theory on the basis of that observation. So science is involved in, in observation and logic, 
Um, you get a theory and then you test the theory because the theory will um, predict certain observations and you test um, whether the, th the predictions that you've um, derived from your theory are in fact true or not. Uh, and if they are, then your theory is confirmed to, to a small extent. And if they're not, your theory is falsified. Um, the trouble is that you can't make an observation that isn't informed by theory. Um, so so here, let's, let's, take, let's take red, for example. What, what do you think the word red means? Would anyone like to have a go at telling me what the word red means? Okay. Gone. Well, like, it's a colour, but we, we all know it's a colour because it's like kind of the word red is a symbol that we kind of agreed upon to, to mean a certain thing. So, like, because we all speak the same language, but, like, okay. It's a symbol that means something. We all agree that it means the same thing. Okay, you're, you're absolutely right, but what I'm asking is what is that meaning? Um, so, we have the. Uh, did I have a flip chart somewhere? I did ask for one. Okay, so so you think the meaning of the word red is reflects light at 650 nanometers? Yeah, exactly. Okay, anyone have any other <laughs> meaning of the word red? A social construct that has different meanings in different contexts. A social construct that has different meaning in different contexts. Can you give me an example of two different meanings of red? <laughs> Red Dead. Red Dead. Oh, <laughs> yes, that's a good one. Manchester United. Yes, there's a correlation, isn't there, an association between Manchester United and, and, and between socialism and, and red. But that's not usually thought of as the meaning of it. But it has, it has different symbolism in different cultures. So, for example, in the West, it would be seen as, da as an indicator danger. danger. Mm -hmm. um, in China, it would be seen as a symbol of prosperity. And, and in India, it's a symbol of marriage, isn't it? Um, yes, okay, but, but these are actually, these are associations rather than meanings. Um, okay, let, let's take the meaning that you've given me, but, but red is um, that which reflects light at 650 nanometers. Um, Okay, let's do a thought experiment about that. Now, a thought experiment is what philosophers do, and it's very comfortable because we don't have to leave our armchairs to do it. Um, a scientist does an experiment in the laboratory, and the scientist is ex constrained in the design of that experiment by the laws of nature. Now, a philosopher is also constrained in the thought experiment he or she conducts, but not by the laws of nature, rather by the laws of logic. But we're trying to do the same thing. Um, we're saying, OK, we, the idea is that A is B. Well, if I, can if I can design an experiment that pulls apart A and B so I get A without B or B without A, then I know that A and B are not the same thing. OK, so it would work exactly the same way in the laboratory as it would um, in your mind. Um, OK, so let's imagine a cosmic ray of some kind. Cosmic rays are very useful to philosophers. Um, what the cosmic ray does is it makes objects like, um, let's pretend your jacket is red. It's probably an orangey sort of colour, isn't it? But let, let's, let's say it's red. Um, okay, so cosmic ray hits and it makes things like that reflect light. Instead of its um, 650 nanometers, it reflects light at 400 nanometers. Now, usually, that would mean that we start to see it as blue. But this is a very odd cosmic ray, because what it does is it changes the wavelengths, but it doesn't change our experience. So we continue to see the jacket look like that, but it reflects light at six, uh, 400 nanometers. OK, has the color of that jacket changed or not? Put your hand up if you think not. It looks like that still. Has the colour changed? Put your hand right up so I can see you. Don't be half-hearted. Okay, so most of you think not. Okay, who thinks that the colour of that jacket has changed? And who's putting their hand up twice? <laughs> That's not allowed. You can't have both. Um, 
You can have neither, because sitting on the fence is always a good thing to do. Those of you who put your arms up the second time are wrong. Um, we, there's no way we would say that the colour of the jacket had changed when all that had changed is the, the wavelength of the light reflected from the jacket. If the jacket looks like that, we would say that it's still red or orange or whatever it is. Um, and what we learn from that is that red isn't the wavelength, of, or rather that the meaning of red is not the wavelength of light. We know that the colour red is realised. Um, there's that word again, I used it before when I was talking about the mind. We know that the colour red is realised by um, objects reflecting at light at 650 nanometers, but that's not the meaning of the word red because the meaning of the word red is far more closely linked to our experience of colors than the fact that colors reflect light um, at certain wavelengths. I'll come to you in a second. Um, so that gives us another hypothesis about the meaning of the word red. Is the meaning of the word red that experience I have when I look at, what's your name? Jilly. Jilly Jilly's jacket. Yeah. Jilly? Yeah. Okay. So I'm having a certain experience when I'm looking at Jilly's jacket, and so are you. Is red that experience? Put up your hand if you think, yes, it is. Okay, you're wrong as well. <laughs> um, shall I tell you why you're wrong? Okay, this is why you're wrong. Um, okay, when you're teaching a child um, the colour words, okay, so you say that's blue, that's red, that's da 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 da, um, and um, eventually, having done that a bit, and you, you point to all sorts of, I mean, if you point only to curtains, you're asking for trouble, aren't you? Um, you also point to other things, you point to jackets and carpets and jumpers and chairs and um, other blue things. Um, but eventually, you'll start saying, is that blue? And you might point to something red and say, is that blue? And what you're hoping is that the child's going to say no. Now, you, can't, you have no idea what the child sees. You don't know what the child's experience is like, do you? So how can you check that if, if the word red means that inaccessible private experience? So you have no idea what I see when I look at Jilly's jump, uh, jacket, do you? Um, you? You probably assume that you're seeing what I see, but you have no idea whether that's true or not. And yet we manage to communicate by means of that word red. We think it has the same meaning for all of us. And when you're teaching a child, you want that child to grasp the meaning that you grasp. But you'd never be able to check it, would you? If red means a private experience, an experience that's essentially private. So we know that the meaning of the word red is neither the wholly objective um, wavelengths that's that an object reflects light at. Um, and we also know that it's not the wholly subjective experience that we have when we see a colour. Um, so what does red mean, do you think? Do you want to have another go? <laughs> not blue. Uh, not blue. <laughs> Um, it's certainly true that you haven't grasped the word red unless you've grasped that it's not blue. Um, you've got to distinguish things, that's, that's true. A defined brain state associated with what it is that goes on in your head, it doesn't have to be the same for a different people. Okay, when you say a defined brain state, do you mean that? <laughs> what does he mean? <laughs> He means experience, actually, doesn't he? Um, actually, the, th the fact is we might all have a different experience when we look at red. It's hugely unlikely, but, but it is possible. It's logically possible. Um, what red is, it's one of those concepts that actually you can't define without circularity. An object is red if it appears red to a normal human being under normal circumstances. So you can't define the word red without appealing to the... Uh, appearance of red, but you also can't define it without, experience, without appeal to objects. And of course, the reason that objects that um, are red appear red to all of us instead of just one of us is because it's not the private experience that matters. As Wittgenstein puts it, you have to have an experience when your mother is teaching you red 
Um, and that experience must be different from the experience you have when you look at blue, but actually it doesn't matter a toss what that experience is, as long as you have it and it's different. So Wittgenstein said, it's not a something, but it's not a nothing either, um, your, <laughs> your experience of red. So, so what we were doing there was conducting a thought experiment. We were putting things apart in logic to see whether we were right to identify them. And we see that we weren't right to identify them. We've got to pull them apart. Now, there's a question there, but there was a question there first. Um, was it you? Can, can you speak up? No, no, it doesn't turn blue. It starts reflecting light at 400 nanometers instead of 600 nanometers. That doesn't mean it turns blue. That's what we're asking, whether that does mean it's turned blue. But what about Well, um, when I gave the actual definition of red, which is that uh, an object is red if it appears red, to normal human beings under normal circumstances, the, the reference to a normal human being is absolutely vital. And so is the reference to normal circumstances, because of course, red objects do not appear red if they're under a, a strange light. Um, so it's not required that a red object must always appear red. It, it only appears red to normal human beings under normal circumstances. Okay? And you and you and then we must move on. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of troubled by this. Oh, dear. <laughs> as a physicist, I'm not so interested in the object as in the, the light that comes from it. And, you know, as a physicist, I, I know that red is red light has certain wavelengths. So, you know, independent of the object, what you see coming into your eye has a certain wavelength. If you have a prism, it will split white light into a number of colours. You look at red, what you're seeing is a particular wavelength. Yeah. But, but what you're telling me is, is the empirical story about what we have discovered redness to be. I mean, when an object um, appears red to a normal human being under normal circumstances, we have discovered, science has discovered, um, that that object is reflecting light at 600 nanometers. So that's something we've discovered about redness. There's no object involved in this, and we're talking about light. Well, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, the light, okay, but the object, the light is reflected and deflected from the object. And that's what we see as redness, isn't it? Well, you could have, can, I, yeah. can I just say that these are scientific experiments where the... I, I actually don't care. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, sorry, can I stop you? Philosophical, but you project the two... Uh, uh, sodium bars, which are two discrete things, and you can see all the colours. I'm absolutely sure you can. So you can see it, even though you're looking at yellow light. Okay. So you perceive it, so it's your argument. Uh, what, what we're looking at is not what the scientific story about redness is. So, for example, gold has atomic number 79. Um, does gold mean atomic number 79? No, it doesn't. Because you know, did you know that it was atomic number 79? Okay, does that mean you didn't understand the meaning of gold before you came here? No. You, you think you did understand the meaning of gold? I understood my meaning of gold. Oh, oh. <laughs> Is that your husband? <laughs> when he gave you your wedding ring, okay, if you'd asked him whether it was gold, it was one you're, of the consensus is we Okay. But do you see what I mean? We, we communicate I mean the meaning comes when we can communicate by means of words. Um, we knew what gold was. When science discovered that the atomic number of gold is seventy nine, what science discovered was something about gold. It didn't change the meaning of gold. It, it gave us an extra belief about what gold was. And in exactly the same way, we had the meaning of the word red before science came along and told us um, that a redness um, was what happens when a light is reflected off an object at 650 nanometers. I, I'm not interested in any more physics. Um, so, because <laughs> we're going on to politics, and I want to leave it time for a couple of questions here. Sorry, you had a question, didn't you? Good. <laughs> but it just occurs to me quite simply that if 
we observe red as an indoctrinated memory, for example, we're told it's red. I think I prefer physics. <laughs> How do we know that this is the truth? Um, um, red is not the truth, whatever is the case. True, I mean, actually, I'm quite happy to talk about true, if you like, because truth is a very interesting philosophical thing. Um, can I talk about it in a minute? Because I'm going to talk about truth on the next slide. So, um, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to say politics, okay, philosophy of politics, what's political philosophy? Okay, what's justice? What's equality? What are the principles by which we should govern society? I mean, should we, um, let, let's look at the distribution of property. Um, I mean, one of the jobs that a government does is, is back up some distribution of property. It might be equality. Or it might, I mean, in this country, for example, it's not equality exactly, but equality is important because we have a, a redistributive um, society, don't we? So um, you, what's your name? Patricia. Patricia. You go out um, to earn a living and 22% uh, at the very least of everything you earn is taken away from you by the government. Well, why is the government making you slave for that 22% of time? For nothing. How can you justify that? Well, we justify it on the grounds that that 22% goes to build hospitals, roads, schools, etc. Um, and we might ask, well, if you don't have children, I don't have children, um, why should I pay for schools? I'm a pretty healthy person. Why should I pay for hospitals? Come to that. Um, so, so there's a, a principle of justice behind the idea of the of how you decide to distribute wealth within a society you might decide not to get involved at all so you whatever you earn you keep so there's no income tax at all now you might think you might you would like that society but think about a society in which there isn't any income tax charged um, there's no taxation so there wouldn't be any state built hospitals roads schools um, etc. So that, that's just one issue in political philosophy. Um, religion, of course, the big one, does God exist? Um, what's he like? Um, is free will compatible with determinism? Um, so uh, we think that the actions we perform, or some of them at least, are freely chosen by us. Um, but actually, um, you might also think that they're causally determined. So the laws of physics being what they are, um, everything you do is a result of the laws of nature plus whatever the conditions were just before you did it in your brain apart from anywhere else. Well, can an action be both causally determined and freely chosen? And if so, how? That looks like a logical problem, doesn't it? A token action. So just one action, my lifting my arm up there, was, was that both causally determined and freely chosen by me? Um, and if so, how? Well, a soft determinist would say yes, um, because free will and determinism are compatible. A hard determinist would say no, free will and determinism aren't compatible, and you were determined. That's why I raised my arm. And a libertarian would say they aren't compatible, but you freely chose to, to raise your arm. And so there are three different positions. Um, and of course, all of us want to be compatibilists. We all want to think that you're both free and determined. Um, but actually, then you've got the logical problem of, of whether a token action can be both free and determined. So that, that's philosophy of religion. Of course, we haven't got free will, though there isn't any morality either. Um, because an action is moral only if it's freely chosen. And if you're a kleptomaniac, then you won't be put in prison for stealing. You might be put in hospital, but you're not put in prison. Um, okay, if any subject matter is peculiarly the province of philosophy, I've said the province of philosophy is everything, but these four um, are peculiarly the province of philosophy. Logic. Um, I mean, some of you might have listened to my podcasts. Um, there are podcasts on the um, critical reasoning. I look at what is an argument, um, how can we analyze an argument, how do we evaluate an argument, and so on. Um, 
So logic is the, the methodology used by philosophy. Now, it's used by scientists too, and used by human beings all the time. You are here today because of a little argument that went, um, OUDC said it was going to have an open day. I'd quite like to go to the open day, therefore I'll go there now. Um, well, that sort of practical reasoning is what brought you here. Um, so argument is what human beings do all the time. To be rational is to argue. Um, and what a philosopher does is, is stand back and look at what arguments are, what counts as a good argument, why it counts as a good argument, and so on. Um, ethics. I noticed that these two have something in common. What they have in common is that they're both normative. Um, so physicists or, or any sort of scientist is concerned with the way the world is okay it conducts experiments to look at the way the world is or the way the world could be under different situations um, what it's not interested in is the way the world should be that's the province of philosophy um, so um, you should argue in a certain way if your arguments are bad, they shouldn't be. Um, and we all understand that. If you, if you derive from a set of premises a conclusion that actually doesn't follow from that conclusion, there's something normatively wrong with that argument, isn't there? You have argued badly. So bad and good come into it. Right and wrong come into it. Should and shouldn't come into it. And exactly the same thing happens here with ethics. So just as there are norms about their standards um, in accordance with which you should argue, in exactly the same way there are standards in accordance with which you should behave. Um, and you can leave your knife anywhere you like, but not in my chest. Um, and that's because it, it's wrong to do that. Um, so a philosopher would say, well, what does it mean to say something's wrong? What is it for an action to be wrong? What is it for an action to be right? Um, which actions are right? Which actions are wrong? And of course, in the public sphere, that becomes political philosophy. as ethics writ large is, is politics. Um, metaphysics. Um, when you're doing metaphysics, what you're looking at is your ontology, your list of what exists. And you're also asking what its nature is. So, okay, we looked at, do mental states exist? Well, the eliminativists think not. Um, the rest of us think yes. Um, but once you think that mental states exist, you've got to say, well, what are they? What distinguishes a mental state from a physical state? We know that physical things um, occupy space. Um, I mean, the, there may be things in the very small sphere um, that occupy space in a rather odd way, but uh, certainly all macro objects um, are three-dimensional. Um, well, are mental states three-dimensional? Of course they are if they're brain states, but we've already looked at whether they're brain states, maybe they're not. In which case, maybe minds are not inside the head, they're not located in space in the way physical objects are. And if I can't think about uh, Michelle without Michelle existing, it looks as if my belief about Michelle is a relation between me and Michelle rather than something that's located in my head, doesn't it? Um, so that, that's metaphysics. Uh, and epistemology, well, okay, I'm talking about how we can know things about what's true and what's not. Um, well, how can I justify claim to know that something's true or not? I mean, my... You all think that you're sitting watching a lecture in, in the lecture theatre in uh, OUDCE, but you might any minute wake up and find you've still got that bloody lecture to go to tonight. You wish you hadn't signed on now. Um, so you have reason to think that you're watching a lecture. Of course you do. I mean, everything's with you as if you're sitting watching a lecture. But you know as well as I do that you could wake up any minute and you're up home in bed. Um, so the reason you have for thinking you're in a lecture is not conclusive. Can you have conclusive reasons for anything? And if you can't, then can you know anything? What, what is knowledge anyway? Um, knowledge involves truth. Um, you can't know something false, and before you all shout at me, you can believe that you know something false, but your belief is false. <laughs> 
So, so you can think you know that the Earth is flat, and there was a time when lots of people believed they knew the Earth was flat, but their belief that the Earth was flat was false, and therefore their belief that they knew the Earth was flat was also false, because a belief that's false cannot be knowledge. And if you do epistemology, you know that. So um, this was billed as philosophy in 45 minutes, and I think that's 45 minutes. So um, I hope I've convinced you that philosophy is the best subject in the world. And if you want to do any more, there's, there's all these things that you can do, including my podcasts, which are completely free uh, and available on iTunes U. Thank you for listening.